In our last video, we discussed the types of blood cells found in peripheral blood, as well as talked about how these cells form in the bone marrow. In this video, we'll discuss the hemoglobin molecule and what happens when its structure is interrupted, and we'll examine one type of anemia in more detail, hemolytic anemia, and discuss the various ways in which it may come about. But let's start off by talking about the workhorse of the RBC, hemoglobin, abbreviated HB, in particular its structure. As we learned in the last video, the job of RBCs is to carry oxygen around the body. So let's go ahead and draw our model of an RBC. We'll start with red, and we'll go ahead and draw in a slightly lighter colored center because we know that these are biconcave shape, which means they're lighter in the center when you look under the microscope. And we know that these red blood cells are packed full of hemoglobin, abbreviated HB. So I'll just draw in a bunch of HBs to represent the huge amount of hemoglobin that's in each red blood cell. Now each of these hemoglobins is actually what binds and transports the oxygen from its loading in the lungs until it can be offloaded somewhere else in the periphery in the tissue. Now hemoglobin is a tetramer and we'll model it like this. It has four subunits, usually two of each type, and together they form the fully functional hemoglobin. Now each one of these subunits has a porphyrin group containing iron. So we'll draw in the symbol for iron, Fe, into each subunit. And the iron is actually what binds the oxygen in the lungs and carries it around to the body. And each one of these can bind an oxygen. So I'll go ahead and draw an oxygen in each one of these subunits. And it's important to note that the hemoglobin is inside the cell, that it should never be outside of the cell. Because the reason they're contained is because these iron atoms can cause oxidative damage if they weren't contained inside the cell membrane of the RBC. Within the human genome, there are different genes that code for different subunits, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. They can all be combined in different ways to form different types of hemoglobin, depending on a number of different factors. As a result, there are many types of hemoglobin, but each of them carries oxygen around the body. Some of these hemoglobin types are better than others at doing their job, simply based on the fact that the structure of the different subunits either enhances or inhibits the binding of oxygen. The alpha subunit is encoded by two genes on chromosome 16. The beta subunit, on the other hand, is encoded by one gene only on chromosome 11. The genes for the gamma and delta subunits are also located on chromosome 11. Let's start off with the three normal variants of hemoglobin, shown here. The first one is hemoglobin A, and the A here stands for adult. Hemoglobin A is a tetramer of two alpha and two beta subunits, abbreviated alpha 2, beta 2. Hemoglobin A dominates in adult blood, though there is some of a second form of hemoglobin, called hemoglobin A2, floating around as well. Hemoglobin A2 is two alpha subunits, but this time they're bound to two delta subunits. We'll come back to hemoglobin A2 a little later on when we talk about some of the hemoglobinopathies. The third type of hemoglobin is made primarily in the womb, and it's called hemoglobin F, where the F stands for fetal. Hemoglobin F is made of two alpha subunits and two gamma subunits. Hemoglobin F has a slightly higher affinity for oxygen than does hemoglobin A, so that the fetus can get fresh oxygen by having its hemoglobin F steal some of the oxygen away from the mother's hemoglobin A. Once the baby is born, hemoglobin F production gradually gives way to hemoglobin A, as fewer gamma subunits and more beta subunits are produced. Now hemoglobin A, hemoglobin A2, and hemoglobin F are all normal variants of hemoglobin, where all of the hemoglobin subunit genes are working normally. But what if there were a problem in one of the hemoglobin genes? If that were the case, then the hemoglobin molecule would not form as normal, which may lead to problems if the mutation is severe enough to either prevent normal functioning or normal production. In the various hemoglobinopathies, that is, in the diseases involving malformed hemoglobin molecules, that's exactly what happens. We can broadly classify the various hemoglobinopathies into two categories. In the qualitative varieties, the hemoglobin itself has a defect affecting the quality of hemoglobin produced. In the quantitative types, it's the number of copies of hemoglobin produced that causes the pathology. Let's first look at an example of a qualitative hemoglobinopathy. The prototypical example is sickle cell anemia, so let's go ahead and write that down. Sickle cell anemia. Individuals with sickle cell are homozygous for a point mutation in their beta gene, causing valine to replace glutamic acid in the sixth position. The result is a defective form of the beta subunit. Now we said that normal hemoglobin looks like this, which we named hemoglobin A, and it's made of two normal alpha subunits in blue and two normal beta subunits in green. But what happens in sickle cell anemia? 
Well, let's represent it like this. And this variant of hemoglobin is called HBS. And it's made of two alpha subunits, two normal alpha subunits in blue, and two defective beta subunits in yellow. This small structural change is enough to cause the hemoglobin S molecules to polymerize within the cell, like this. This causes the RBC to take on a sickled shape, not the normal biconcave disc that it would normally have. Now we learned in the last video that part of the reason for having this biconcave disc shape is that it allows the RBCs to bend and fold a little bit when they're going through the smallest blood vessels in the body. So let's demonstrate that here by drawing out a small blood vessel. And in the normal condition, we have our biconcave discs, RBCs, that travel nicely down this blood vessel through the twists and turns and down into the rest of the circulation of this vessel. The sickle cell variant, on the other hand, they're slightly misshapen, and they have a tendency to get stuck on these corners, and in a bad situation, they can actually clog up and prevent this circulation from going all the way through. When the sickled RBCs get stuck in the vessels, this blocks proximal blood from getting past, and it deprives distal tissue from being supplied with fresh oxygen. This leads directly to the typical presentation of a patient with sickle cell anemia. The occlusion from the sickled cells can cause infarcts anywhere in the body, but the bone marrow and the spleen are commonly affected. Strokes are also likely. As far as treatment goes, the drug hydroxyurea is used, which stimulates the body to produce more hemoglobin F in place of hemoglobin S. The higher levels of hemoglobin F prevent the hemoglobin S from being produced, which is what causes the pathology in the first place. Interestingly, heterozygosity for sickle cell anemia is thought to confer protection against malaria, as heterozygotes do not suffer from sickle cell disease, but are protected against malaria infection. Let's now look at an example of a quantitative hemoglobinopathy. The typical example here is thalassemia, and there are two types, alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia. In thalassemia, the production of either the alpha or the beta hemoglobin genes are reduced, leading to an excess of the normal subunit. The normal subunits clump together, preventing oxygen from being uptaken and offloaded effectively. For example, if the alpha genes were to have decreased production, we would have excess beta subunits, which would clump together like this. The same would be true for the alpha subunits, like this. In this case, we would have decreased beta and excess alpha subunits. The subunit which carries the deficit gives the condition its name. Thus, alpha thalassemias have a deficit in alpha subunit production, while beta thalassemias have a deficit in beta subunit production. We mentioned before that the alpha subunit is encoded by two genes, thus each person has four alpha alleles, two from mom and two from dad. Because of this, there are four varieties of alpha thalassemia increasing in severity from losing just one alpha gene to losing all four. Losing one alpha gene usually causes no problems. Losing two may present with mild anemia and microcytosis, or small RBCs. Losing three genes causes severe anemia, and these patients need regular blood transfusions. The loss of all four alpha genes is incompatible with life. The beta subunit is only encoded by one gene, so each person has two alleles, one from mom and one from dad. In beta thalassemia, the production of the beta subunit is reduced, with the severity of the disease corresponding to the degree of reduction. In place of the beta subunit, the body produces excess delta subunits, forming HbA2 which, if you remember, is made of two alpha and two delta subunits. Thus, excess hemoglobin A2 is a marker for beta thalassemia. In both sickle cell anemia and the varieties of thalassemia, the body struggles to make enough normal hemoglobin to effectively deliver oxygen to all of its tissues. But we still have to answer a basic question. Why do we get anemia, or decrease in RBCs? To explain this, it's helpful to go back to the flow diagram we used in the first video, with production in the bone marrow on one side, removal in the spleen on the other, and peripheral circulation in the middle. Now, normal red blood cells are removed from circulation in the spleen after about 120 days. But abnormal RBCs are removed even faster, for example, after only 10 to 20 days in sickle cell anemia, since the body wants to clear the abnormal RBCs as fast as possible. In the case of sickle cell anemia and thalassemia, this is because of their abnormal hemoglobin, which causes the RBC to be deformed, as we saw a couple of minutes ago. But the main point here is that anything that damages the red blood cell will cause it to undergo premature breakdown, or hemolysis. If the amount of hemolysis, or removal from circulation of red blood cells, is severe and rapid enough to overcome RBC production, it will lead to a deficit of RBCs called hemolytic anemia.
This is a really important concept, and we'll explore it more in our next video when we discuss the various mechanisms of hemolytic anemia.